I want to welcome you all on behalf of the University of Florida IFAS Extension Polk County. Thank you for joining us this evening for our gardening and landscaping webinar on growing tomatoes. We have just a little bit of information to share before we get started. There's a beautiful photo, more details to come from Carol, the presenter on that, but growing tomatoes on your Central Florida lanai. And so uh, just a little bit of information about webinars. If this is your first one, we'd ask everyone to please keep your video and microphone off. If you have any questions, feel free to type those in the chat and questions will be addressed at the end of the presentation. I do wanna mention that the University of Florida is an equal opportunity institution. We appreciate your participation this evening. If you feel as though you've been discriminated against in our programming, please feel free to file a complaint with the USDA. You can do so by filling the form out on their website. You can give them a call at 866-632-9992, or you can write a letter addressed to the USDA, but we do appreciate your participation. We are recording this webinar. A little bit about extension if you're not familiar. We're a partnership between federal, state, and local government. And so main campus is located in Gainesville. And then we have researchers and research centers in Gainesville and throughout the state. And so locally here in Polk County, we have programming available to Polk County residents on gardening and landscaping, healthy living and nutrition, citrus, livestock, small farms, the Master Gardener Volunteer Program, 4-H for Youth, and many other programs. And speaking of the Master Gardener Volunteer Program, Master Gardener Volunteers are trained volunteers that offer workshops, activities for youth. They work in our demonstration gardens to display the Florida-friendly landscaping principles. And when they also offer a plant clinic at our office in Bartow. So please feel free to reach out to our Master Gardener Volunteers or attend any of their programming, just like this tonight, that's presented by Master Gardener Volunteers of UF IFAS Extension Polk County. And so now I'd like to welcome Carol, our presenter for this evening. Carol, take it away. Good evening, everybody. And we're really glad you are spending some of your time with us tonight. Um, we hope you'll enjoy the program. So tonight, we're gonna to talk about tomato topics. This has been a journey of 150 days last year of some tomatoes that I raised. Um, the topics that we're going to cover are preparing in January for March planting, the 10 top reasons or, or characteristics to grow tomatoes on your lanai, a selected variety that I used was the heirloom mortgage lifter, we're going to talk about right plant, right place, right time, starting from seed and keeping records, transferring seedlings to four inch pots, transferring to growth and fruiting pots, container care and support system, flower and fruit development, and the bad, the bugly, and the ugly. And then we'll get into harvesting and finally into the kitchen. Um, preserving foods, red ripe to green, and ending the season. So an introduction to Florida vegetable gardening. Florida vegetable gardening is quite different from other parts of the United States. The phrase right plant, right place, and right time is the key to success in Florida edibles gardening. Whether one lives in North, Central, or South Florida, it is important to choose the correct time to plant as well as choosing the appropriate cultivars. Site selection, a plan, soil preparation, fertilizing, irrigation and drainage, and integrated pest, pest management are important tools for success. And you see below a chart that is in a, a publication that I'm going to show you that you can access online that shows you crops from A to Z and how to plant them, spacing, transplantability, seed depth, all of the particulars for starting a garden. So growing tomatoes in Central Florida. 
In Central Florida, tomatoes may be started by seed beginning in January or August. There's two seasons. If starting from a transplant, a month later because you already have the plant grown up from seed. Cultivars with fewer days to maturity can vary the schedule. And as an example, a long season tomato, like an heirloom, might take 80 to 85 days versus anywhere from 50 to 70 for smaller uh, cultivars, starting from cherry tomatoes. Select a cultivar using the publication SP103. It's called Florida Vegetable Gardening Guide. And I have put for you the front page of this. It's a long guide. Uh, it really takes you through all of the steps of gardening, it is the, year after year, it is the number one accessed guide of all the publications of UF IFAS. January seed starts, allows time for seedling growth indoors, use full spectrum lights and bottom warmth during germination, or place the tray by a sunny window. And at the bottom is the link for the Florida Vegetable Gardening Guide which I, th I think um, will be placed in the chat box. The most important decision is choosing an appropriate cultivar. And it all has to do with your goals. Think about what your goals are before you select your plant. Do you want a fresh product that you're going to use uh, for daily uh, meals? Do you want to pick a determinant tomato plant, an indeterminate tomato plant, and all of these items are covered within the gardening guide. You can select cultivars which are disease and or nematode resistant or tolerant, and these are covered also within the guide uh, by name. So always be sure that you're going to pick the cultivar that meets your goal and your intended usage. So, we say for plants in Florida, in Florida-friendly landscaping, right plant, right place. For edibles, we have to add right time because the right plant, you're already going to choose within the publication we discussed. The right place is six to eight hours of sunlight, an adequate water source with which plants can be watered at soil level. Tomatoes should never be watered overhead and the right time for a quick guide for any vegetable that you're looking to plant. You can use these infographics. The, um, the link is at the bottom. And every single month has an infographic for edibles. In Central Florida, native seeds can be planted during January to February or during August to September. Plants may be started in light, indoors under lights. So here's the top 10 list. Why would you want to grow tomatoes on your Lebanon? Number one, plants are observable from indoors. It assists you knowing when the plants want to be watered. While I was growing tomatoes, I could look out from the living room and the leaves would tell me, it's time to water, you've forgotten to water today. It's real handy because you can get involved in doing other things and forget. Plants are established during weeks of low heat and humidity and before the onset of the rainy season, and that's very important. This timing may lessen the incidence or severity of fungal diseases. The harvest may be completed prior to the rainy season. Sun exposure may be maximized in a screen enclosure if it's not available outside in your yard. Most tomato pests and insects are excluded. Birds and small animals are excluded from feeding or digging in plantings. And I know we've all experienced that with um, not only edibles plantings, but with, uh, but with uh, flowers and ornamentals. Nematodes are excluded when using potting soil or amended planting mediums rich in organic matter. No outdoor pollinators are required. Tomato blooms are complete flowers and as such are self-pollinating. 
A plant support method can be devised to protect large plants during windy conditions. And lastly, the use of a seven gallon or larger nursery pot provides adequate space for root and plant development, as well as ease of controlled fertilizer additions. So about this time last year, I started these, these seeds between two paper towels. It took about three days for them to reach this point of germination. Um, as I said, the cultivar used was mortgage lifter. It's an indeterminate tomato with a maturity of 80 to 85 days. While I was putting this, this show together or this program together, there's now an improved cultivar for mortgage lifter that has improved disease resistance. Seeds were germinated between paper toweling and then transferred into potting soil in small peat pots. If germinating seeds indoors in planting medium, use of a heat mat is helpful. So you see at three days, at four days, when I place them under the soil mix, and by the next day, they're up. They're up and running. At 14 days, plants raised under lights should receive 16 hours of light per day. Young plants should be no more than two inches from the light source. As the plants grow taller, you can adjust the light source to prevent legginess. Windowsill plants are subject to a lack of light that causes plants to become leggy, and you need to turn those plants um, during the day so that they receive even light. Alternatively, you can move those trays outside during daylight and bring them back at night uh, because it's still chilly within January and February. So early growth. This is 14 days. It's the same picture we looked last picture we looked at last time. And at this point, the seed has germinated. It has grown the first roots. It is showing the first seed leaves, which are called cotyledons. And these are shown here. And you can see that these leaves, the cotyledons, are very different looking than the first set of true seed leaves. That is because the cotyledons are using a storage of food within the seed to feed this early plant growth until the true leaves appear and can photosynthesize. So this is, this is kind of um, miraculous to think about what's going on within the seed because a seed is really, really contains an embryonic plant. And you can see here that this is the radical of the root. These are within, within the seed before germination. These are the, the seed leaves. This is the food supply, the endosperm, and then the seed coat, which is going to um, allow the root to come out, the plant to come out. So the seed leaves function is to access the stored nutrients in the seed, feeding the young plant until true leaves develop and begin to photosynthesize. The two narrow leaves are the cotyledons. The next set are the true leaves, and those leaves will resemble the mature leaves of the plant. So looking at this, you can see uh, the cotyledons, and they're much more green than are the first two seed leaves because they are still being fed by the endosperm. So these are the seedlings at um, various days, at 16 days. At 21 days, you see they're getting kind of tall at this point. At 27 days and at 28 days. And I wanna say something about these last two sets of pictures because you see that these plants are starting to get tall, um, except for this one here. And you have to think about that. Why is that true? Well, actually that's because that was two plants and they were treated the same way as all the other plants. All of these are singles. Here's the double. Here's the double, you see it at a younger age. And this is a good example of of a plant that's not getting as many resources as a single plant because they have to share the resources that are within that peat pot. So at 29 days, that's a day later, I think it was, 
plants are potted into four and five inch pots. We went outside, uh, took them outside, left them out there. It was warm enough at night that they could begin to um, acclimate. The high temperature that day was 66, the low was 54. Uh, not a lot different than we will experience tomorrow and, and tonight. So a good quality potting soil was used. No amendments were added at this stage. The green or yellowed cotyledons were removed and the stems were sunk into soil. You could leave them there. Uh, I just chose not to. I didn't want to um, introduce into the soil um, dying material at that point. Early buds are removed. And this is, and you see the, the early bud over here. One, two, I think there's three of them. And this is to direct the plant's energy to vegetative growth instead of allowing this plant to say, I'm gonna fruit, I'd, I'd like to fruit now. We don't want it to fruit now. We want it to um, continue with strong vegetative growth. So this is just a few days later, a couple days later, we're preparing the soil mix and planting into seven gallon pots. When I say a seven gallon pot, that's a nursery pot size. The actual content of that pot is 6.3 gallons. So the soil is that I used was a commercial potting mix for vegetables. Uh, the amendments were peat moss because tomatoes appreciate a slightly acidic soil. Composted cow manure for nitrogen, garden lime was placed in the initial planting hole. As the soil mix did contain a controlled release fertilizer, no additional fertilizer was added at planting time. Over time, we will see during the program that that supply was exhausted and a balanced controlled release fertilizer for vegetables with miners was added in the future. About half season is when that was done. So placement of the tomato cages at 53 days, they are in a, an area where they're re receiving sun all day long. They show good growth at 10 days since potting. I mean, it's, it's really astounding how fast they can grow at this time. Plants received deep daily waterings. Wire tomato cages were placed soon after, and you wanna do that as soon as possible so that you avoid damage to the roots. One week later, the first appearance of insects. Um, tiny little insects appeared. So to try to get a snapshot of that, I used some non-toxic yellow fly, fly paper and hung it between every other plant. Um, the problem that occurred during this point in time was that we had some workmen working for several days and they left the doors open a lot. So the two insects that we did photograph uh, were just fungus gnats, neither are tomato pests, and so were not sig significant. However, I will say that at a very early point, probably at this point or soon after, we did see some leaf miner activity. Uh, it's just inevitable. Uh, plants were moved across the lanai on March 20th. So when you're looking for an insect, you want to know what your target is. In this case, the leaf miner fly was the target. It was not found. And the insects that were found were insignificant. Initial fruit cultural practices. Now we're at day 72 to 75 from seed. And watering is continued daily. It's done on a deep watering basis. Temperatures were unusually high during this season with very little rain. Very little rain is good because you're not uh, setting yourself up for fungal diseases as long as you are adequately watering each plant. Pollination was achieved and assisted by lightly tapping on the installed cage wires. And as I was watering, I would just, you know, water the plant, tap the cage, and, and move on. At the same time, I'm scouting for visual signs of leaf miners and anything else that would be would catch my eye. 
few were seen as of these dates, but there were there was small incidents. The space between every other plant was installed with yellow fly paper, which is attractive to uh, small flies and uh, insects. So, so day 75, we're in April now, uh, having begun in the middle of January, and plants have begun to set fruit. They continue to flower. They fly, flowered like crazy. Um, while it might be optional or advised to remove some blooms, I did not. And that goes right back to what are your goals and be sure when you are beginning your plan that you know what your goals are. My goals were to grow as many tomatoes as I could to, for preservation products. And I didn't, it wasn't as important to me that I grew one or two pounds of tomatoes. It was important to have um, the largest mass or weight that I could get. And because of that, one reason I did that was that I, uh, when you have a, a tomato that is involved in some way, you chance you chance losing that whole tomato. And I would rather have something involved with a relatively smaller size tomato, so that's the one that's lost, instead of a lot of large tomatoes where I may experience a bigger loss. So as before, the easy view from the house was a really helpful prompt. Um, I could be doing anything in a house and look out and these plants would droop, <laughs> even though they'd been watered the day before, they would droop and say, it's time, come help me. And, and that, that was really important to the process. So also continuing to tap the cages. So the, here's day 85. This is early fruit set. And you can see that those flowers that were shown uh, on the previous plant or previous slide are, are almost all beginning to produce fruit. The flower petals dry and drop off after the fruit formation, and you can see this, and that's the end of the blossom, and that's also a little hint that this is where the blossom end rot occurs, because there's the blossom end rot, if that's a new concept, and you would continue to keep scouting. Here, you can see is a leaf miner, um, trail. There are two or three in the picture if you look real closely. And here is an example of, this is not blossom end rot, this is cat facing, which is very common in heirlooms. And it's um, just a malformation that's sometimes related to watering. Um, they don't really know what causes it for sure, but it really is a characteristic of heirloom tinnitus. So not to be concerned about. There became practical issues as the plant sizes uh, uh, increased. And you can see that very early on, <laughs> it's not a very pretty picture, but it kept them from jumping in the pool. Um, and the stability became an issue as there was a lot of fruit and the weight increased, and during any small wind amount uh, event, these plants could topple over. There, so there became a need to devise a system to tie these plants down so that they could not um, wind up in the pool. You want to be aware of airflow effects of bushier growth from early to late harvest. And you can see that some of these are getting kind of bushy. You want to have some airflow because fungal issues will result where there is little airflow and moisture. Um, luckily, in the springtime, there's not high humidity. So that's a plus of growing at this time. You can reduce the bushiness by removing some of the suckers at the, at the stem angles, at axles. And at this point, the plants have been in the big pots for six weeks. So at six weeks, there was leaf miner damage. And then all of a sudden, there is caterpillar damage. And this would 
be evidenced by picking a tomato as seen below and finding that it's um, already being fed upon. This is a caterpillar. And one of the things that we do profusely is that we take pictures because pictures are your guide to identification for integrated pest management. You want to know what it is you are dealing with. And, and um, yes, it's a caterpillar and some of the same IPM methods are used. But if you can, you want to be able to specifically ID what you're dealing with. So my early assumption, because, and this is how a lot of us think, my early assumption was that this was a fall armyworm. The caterpillar instead was a sweet potato armyworm. And um, the Spodoptera caterpillars are really variable in their color patterns. So this is a pest ID. It was worked on for a lot of hours. You want to compare your own photographs with reliable source information that gives physical characteristics and clues to identifying the caterpillar or insect. Lyle Boos at uh, UF IFAS Insect ID Lab provided information that led to the correct ID. So here is the earlier picture. This is our picture and placed beside the sweet potato army worm. And you can see that the markings are, in fact, the same. So that was a that was um, that was a, a a plus and a valuable thing to do. It was it was educational. So first ripening, changing plant needs. Day ninety eight. Tomato plants have change changing nutritional needs as they transition from the vegetative to the fruit produce, producing stage. The maturity stated that we talked about before is 80 to 85 days. So why 98 days here? Remember that the day count is generally counted from transplant date. The day count used here is from germination date. So it's, it's right on tabs for where it should be. Many things can affect that actual day count, however. Heat, water, nutrition, unevenness is very important of any of the above, and other stressors like insects, fungal disease may weaken the plant's resources and force it to use its resources to do other things than produce good fruit. So if you're using a time relief release fertilizer, make sure you note the date that it should be applied. Very important to keep records. So the plant support system, here we are at day 102 and we devised this system where we use nylon cord fastened by C clamps to the lanai frame at two points. It increased my personal safety by removing obstacles to watering and, and the lower leaves that had leaf miner damage and minor fungal affected areas continued to be removed. Removing leaves near the soil level reduces splat, splashback, which is a fungal risk. So that's, uh, it's, it's a good thing at this point where you have a large plant. If you're watering, you do not want to even get those bottom leaves wet because of fungal issues. Also, if you're gonna remove too many plants, too many leaves from the top of the plant, you may in fact, create a situation where you are uncovering the fruit, which will scald from sunlight. So I did not um, do a lot of that removal. So at this point, the plant production lasted seven more weeks. It seems like we've been doing it a long time, but it was a long season. So here's the fruit weight we were looking at. The reason for the support system the plants were loaded with the weight of, of young tomatoes. And you can see how easy it was for these tomato plants to topple over. Nylon cord was purposely installed across the tomato cages at the, as the point of contact, because I, I, we did not want to tie these plants uh, together and compress the plants. So we used the um, tomato cages as that guide. So we're 
to the bad, the bugly, and the ugly. I will tell a quick story here that, that I was one of those high school students that when I took biology, I really, really did not like looking at pictures of insects. And to read that page, I would cover, cover the picture of the insect. And I'm way over that now. Um, we we um, study bugs at our house pretty, pretty uh, profusely. So these are the things that bug us when we're growing tomatoes. And you've all, if you've grown even one tomato plant have experienced this. You go out and you say, what is going on? So what are the possibilities? We have cultural issues, which are water and rain, nutrition and sun scald that we talked about. We have insect pests. We've talked about leaf miners a little bit and caterpillars. How about others? Uh, we have leaf and plant pathology. What was seen? Was it fungal? Was it bacterial? Was it viral? Um, the latter two were not seen. And issues seen for in-ground plants were absent. And that is translated into insects underground, such as some of them above, scale, mealybugs, cutworms, pupating leaf miners, and nematodes, which are parasitic roundworms on the roots that feed from the roots. Pupating leaf miners may in fact have been an issue, although I did not um, experience that. Leaves with leaf miners in them were removed for the most part. And it's, it's more of an annoyance. If you're going to uh, spray, spray the plants with neem, for example, first of all, you should, um, just remove the small areas of leaves. But if you're going to spray, when you're dealing with 12 large plants, it is um, not practical. So we used other means. Animal damage, small animals and birds were not an issue to lanai tomato plants. So, and, and all of you have, or some of you may have, have experienced that you go out to your tomato plants and the birds are pecking holes in them because they're thirsty. It's the dry season. And little, little animals are digging holes and all kinds of little annoyances. But those particular problems were not in evidence on lanai-grown tomatoes. I want to bring to your attention the tomato insect pest management article. The link is there and I think that uh, it will be provided in the chat for you. And the last thing that I want to remind you is that the first and most important step to managing problems is daily scouting of plants to find problems. When you're watering, look at your plants, see what's going on, see if anything looks different than the other day, see if leaves are, are missing from caterpillars consuming them, look at the fruits, uh, look at the, the entire plant in general during your scouting. So here's the first issue, which was a water issue, minor drought stress. Well, I talked about the fact that I could see them, but this was an exceptionally warm spring. This is an example of drought stress resulting from a short period of underwatering. The plants were very resilient, only the lower leaves were affected, and the damaged leaves were removed. I included this just to show that you can make small mistakes along the way and still succeed. Uh, because when you make a mistake like that, like this, learning occurs, and that's a valuable thing. So common guests, common garden pests of tomatoes. We already covered leaf miners to some extent and moths and caterpillars to a small extent. Pictured is at the right are tomato leaves with leaf miner trails on them. And this is probably for a beginner growing tomatoes, the number one question that people ask, what is this on my tomato leaves? What's going on here? Uh, but this is just the leaf miner fly. And this is this little fly is about 
10 hundredths of an inch, it's very tiny. And here she is shown ovipositing or laying at her eggs underneath, in between the leaf tissues of the tomato leaf. And then they hatch, they begin to eat, and, and these are just their little meal trails where they've been. There are two things you, that you can do. You can remove the leaf if it's highly if it's if it's highly involved, you can squish it if you can see where he is between your thumb and finger. But again, I want to stress that I had this was a system of 12 very large plants and it wasn't practical. So I usually use the removal um, technique. And this might not give anybody any solace. But it is true that leaf miner larvae have choices in the plants that they like to eat that taste good to them. This is involvement on around the same time, a little earlier, on, on my pole beans. And this leaf miner fly, she laid and laid and laid, laid eggs. And these are favored plants. They did not favor bush beans, but this was really interesting to see. So you can feel a little bit better about four or five trails over here. So these are the common insect pests of tomatoes. They're the, the pests that we see outdoors in Florida all the time. Maybe you'll see three or four of them, maybe you'll see seven, you may not see all of them, but in terms of the plants grown on the lanai, here's what we experienced. White flies, none. Tomato hornworms, none. Fruit worm, none. Stink bugs, none. Leaf-footed bugs, none. Aphids, none. Thrips damaged and spider mite damage. None. Now, the latter two, or the, the last one in particular, the, the uh, markings on the leaf may also be confused with other types of damage. So you have to look for the webbing. I did, didn't see any webbing. So, so th this, was a, this was such a big win. Now on the leaf issues, I have two of them. One is early blight. Um, it's a fungus. The early blight can cause severe damage to tomatoes and symptoms can be on any of the above ground parts of the plant, including leaves, stem, and fruits. Advanced symptoms include oval-shaped lesions. Here you see here. You see here. This is one a little bit older. With a yellow chlorotic region around the lesion, notice the yellow, the lesions may or may not have concentric rings. The issues at right, this was my plant, had minor effects on the plants. Damaged leaves were removed and disposed. And by disposed, I mean disposed, um, bagged, and put in the trash because these fungal causing um, agents can, if you put this in your compost heap, some of them can live there for up to 10 years. And so you see, you don't want to keep moving that around your yard. So you wanna take anything damaged and diseased and put it, bag it and, and dispose of it. I also wanna mention a site called U-Scout. And U-Scout is a resource of UF IFAS. And if you just Google U Scout UF IFAS, it will pop up and it has pictures and discussion of all of the diseases and maladies that you might see, not only for tomatoes, but for um, many, many crops. It's a phenomenal site to use. So here's leaf issue number two at 133 days. And you'll remember that I said the season was 150 days, 
at right or the lower leaves at 18 days before the last harvest. There was a lot of good fruit on the plants yet. I knew that I wanted to end the season at 150 days because it's starting to warm up. The plants were old, uh, the, the harvest was good, and there comes a time when the season is over. So looking at this leaf and also these leaves, this is likely a potassium deficiency. Although some di diseases and mite feeding can also cause similar symptoms. Although I didn't see mites, um, but that doesn't mean that maybe they're not there. Maybe you didn't look the right place. A bit available potassium is needed for young developing leaves and fruit. The plant has a response to having low nutrient levels of potassium, magnesium, and so forth within it. And the plant's response to potassium, <laughs> I should say potassium, is for the available potassium to bypass the older lower leaves and transport any available potassium to the upper new leaves and fruit. So the plant knows I have fruit, I have fruit to grow. Um, these, these leaves at the bottom no longer important to the process and, and this nutrient is passed up the plant. So these leaves were removed. And the famous blossom end rot, rot. blossom end rot is caused by a localized calcium deficiency in the developing fruit or situations by inadequate calcium uptake from the uptake from the roots to the fruit. Bear with me because I'm going to transport weight. Symptom occurs at the blossom end of the fruit, but sometimes occurs on the side of the fruit. Low soil calcium, high nitrogen, use of ammoniacal nitrogen, high sol soluble potassium and magnesium in the soil, high salinity, low humidity, and inadequate excess soil moisture could cause blossom end rot. So what's this, all this mean? Because I want to make the point that a lot of the literature that you'll read, you'll read it and go, I don't know what that said. So this, this means but the plant soil is deficient in available calcium. The calcium is, need, is either isn't there or it is there, but it isn't available to the plant by uptake of the roots. Other soil nutrients or cultural factors can prevent calcium uptake by the roots. It can appear on the end or the side of the fruit. And in this case, from a fertilization standpoint, blossom end rot, rot appeared late in the season when soil nutrients had become depleted. The season was soon ending and I knew that and I planned that. So no additional fertilizer was added because at this point when you are virtually done and you have your end date, you don't need to pump in um, further expensive additions to your soil. So here we are at the week ending 132 days. Um, I would pick about 17 tomatoes every two days. And I would maybe find one of these. And so these were um, these were collected over a period of days, kept for the picture, and then moved on. So there weren't all that many of these. This is the sum total. There's one other that I had with blossom end rot, rot over tens and tens of tomatoes. Tomato number six, we're going to talk about just for a second. It has blossom end rot. And here you see this concentric circle, which is a possible viral pathogen. But again, I didn't have any other clues to ID that. So we're we're done with the with the growing season. Record your important milestones during gardening, whether by journal, dedicated notes, or pictorial records. The details of your experience will guide you in the future. 
removed tomato plants should be bagged and disposed along with the earlier small areas that we removed, you know. Never put old tomato plants or residue in your compost pile. Pathogens as well as insects can be harbored in compost. Practice crop rotation in your in-ground as well as container gardens. Next year in these pots, you are not going to grow tomatoes or peppers or anything else in that plant family. Inactive container gardens can also be a source of weeds and insects. Make plans to not only plant that, that uh, container for the next two seasons, but amend the soil as necessary. And also remember to send some, save some seeds for, yourself, for your own use and to share. So we're gonna move into the kitchen at this point. This was the goal, by the way. Tomato nutrition, cooked and raw. Raw contain, contain lycopene, which is a very helpful antioxidant. Fresh or processed are part of a healthy diet. They're low calorie, low fat, low sodium, low carbohydrate. They're a, a good source of potassium. One serving equals 6.35 ounces. And these are the, the USDA nutrition facts. We're going to progress now and look at water bath products and pressure can products as we move into the kitchen. So canning preparation, just like gardening, preparation is half of the job, always. So from days 106 to 108, and this is the early May, the first canning was only two quarts of crushed tomatoes because production was still ramping up, but I saved them and did those two quarts anyway. When waiting for production, tomatoes for a few days may be blanched, crushed, and re refrigerated until there's enough to begin water bath canning. And another option is to freeze. Just as a side point, on this same day, May 4th, was the last day that I canned green beans. So I was done with that season and ready to start a new one and did both on the same day. So product number one is crushed tomatoes. This is the USDA recipe. Uh, there were three water bath canning sessions uh, on on May 5th, or May 9th, May 20th, and May 28th. And this is, whoops, this is the result. 16 quarts of crushed tomatoes. After removing from the water bath canner, you wanna make sure that you check that all have sealed the ping sound, the magic ping. Let stand for 12 to 24 hours before moving them. Remove the bands, wash for storage. Um, jars are stored without the bands and wash the outside of the jars and rims and store in a cool, dark place. They were, they were a beautiful product. Product two was spaghetti sauce. And this is uh, June 3rd. This was the first preparation day. I did do it in two uh, preparations of, of batched tomatoes. This is the, the saved, the juice pulled off and the crushed tomatoes and then reassembled for canning. And on recipe day, this is the spaghetti sauce. This is an overnight reduction product. It's a low and slow cook down because there's sugar in this. And this, this is going to be a pressure canned item because it has other vegetables in it. It is, it, it's, it's a long process because you're gonna cook this down and I did this overnight. You know, you put it on low and slow, low and slow and you get up every couple hours and give it a stir and make sure all is well. Product number three was USDA recipe spicy ketchup at 151 days. So not too far behind on the spaghetti sauce. And this is another cook down item. You know, it's another, it's another overnight. I did can them in very small jars because there's only two of us and it's almost, this has KN in it and it's almost like shrimp sauce. It was delicious. So note for any recipe, 
that has sugar in it, any one of these products, which is a water bath canning product for this one, not for the last one. It takes a low and slow overnight cook, or if, I suppose if you're up really early in the morning, it would be all day long into the evening. So the final harvest, here we are finally, the final harvest, I'm done, I'm almost done. This is 617, 150 days. I went out and picked everything that was left on the plants. The choices are to wait for them to ripen, to have fried green tomatoes, or I chose to make salsa verde. There were enough tomatoes to make three and a half recipes of the ball blue block blue book recipe. So here is the production um, record of that. It was one canning session, no overnight involved. It's water bath, no reduction, jar jarred in small amounts and used the ball canning recipe. And you see up at the top, uh, the different um, items that were in the recipe and there's a recipe link. And this was water bath. This was the final cook down. And this was the addition of all of the spices, and this is the red onions. So this is the final haul, if you can call it that, of tomato products, products for 2023. And this was the goal, to, a, to be able to provide products that I would not be growing, will not be growing tomatoes to can this year. So the total, total net weight as processed was 80 pounds. The total can product was six gallons and one half pint. And I was busy in the kitchen off and on from May 4th to June 21st. And there were 16 quarts of stewed tomatoes, eight pints of spaghetti sauce, five eight ounce jars of salsa verde, 24 individual serving jars of salsa verde, 12 four ounce jars of ketchup and one eight ounce jar of ketchup. It was, it was, it was a fun season of canning. So I thank you all for coming. Uh, on the screen now is the UFI IFAS resources for residential landscape owners or land resident landscapes. And these are the UFIFAS landscape helpful links for basic landscape design and the handbook for Florida yards and neighborhoods and so forth. This is the plant clinic information. The master gardeners maintain a plant clinic, which you may walk do walk in or call or help with issues from your Central Florida yard. The website is given, the Polk County blog is given, and you can follow us on social media at Polk Gardening. These are the selected references for the program you just saw. And I will come back to this slide for anybody that needs them. And also you'll probably be, probably receive uh, some of these links in the chat box. So I want to thank you all for coming. I want to, this was a lot of fun to put together. First of all, I want to thank you for giving us your time and attention tonight because having being able to speak with with others about things as a master gardener is a very important and rewarding part of, of the job. And I want to remind you that it should be fun and that beauty is one of nature's best qualities, whether born of chance or rearranged into elegance. And the bottom picture on the left is what I call my fusion tomato. This is one of the mortgage lifters. And you, if you count the calyxes, you can see this is the fusion of at least three tomato blooms growing into a fuse, fused tomato. And on the right is some of the very last harvest 
that was um, kind of got artistic one night. It was, it was fun. 